person without drugs. This is a one school for all lecture by me, Andrew Thomas, at Westfold University College, which I'll international students to watch by the 29th of August when we next meet, 2024, of course. So we're all familiar with the word epidemiology, the study of or the intervention in pandemics or epidemics, big diseases that affect large, uh, large groups of people. Today we're going to look a little bit at administrative rather than pharmacological ways of dealing with epidemics. Because both health and education can be dealt both with drugs and with organisation. It just happens that health tends to be dealt more with drugs and education tends to be dealt more with organisation. But both could assess them and they're both involved. Um, both health and education involve improvement, involve some kind of vision of the whole human being, but also involve pain in some way. It does hurt when you teach your brain to do things that it hasn't been doing before. So let's not talk about drugs yet. Um, let's talk about organisation. And today we're going to look at two important techniques. And the first one um, was actually identified or isolated as an administrative technique in health by Foucault, who started his famous history of madness um, with these words. At the end of the Middle Ages, leprosy disappeared from the Western world. At the edges of the community, at town gates, large barren un uninhabitable areas appeared, where disease no longer reigned, but its ghost still hovered. For centuries, these spaces would belong to the domain of the inhuman, from the 14th to the, 15th, 14th to the 17th century, by means of strange incantations, they conjured up a new incarnation of evil, another grinning mask of fear home to the constantly renewed magic of purification and exclusion. Foucault was obsessed with leprosy. Um, he was inter interested in, in it because of the way we dealt with it. During the High Middle Ages, the period that he's talking about here, there really was a very successful battle against leprosy. And it was successful because it used this one leprosy technique. Keep people outside the walls. Keep the city clean. What they did, they posted guards at the gates of city, uh, city walls. And they just found out everybody that came in, do they have leprosy or do they not? And if they did have leprosy, they just could not get into the city. If you go to Bergen, in the west of Norway, then you will maybe see St. Jürgen's Hospital, which now is quite near to the centre of town. It's not far from the train station, but then was right at the edge of the city gates. And it was placed there because that's where the lepers had to stay. They weren't allowed into the city. They had to be kept outside because we assumed that within the city, nobody else had leprosy. So let's not st stand in danger of giving it to them. And that is how medieval towns solved the problem of leprosy. And that's why it didn't become quite such a problem in the early modern age. That's not true of the plague. The plague was a problem in early modernity. And the towns of early modernity, 1500s, for example, 1400s, 1500s, they dealt with the plague very differently because the plague was much more contagious if you came anywhere near somebody with the plague, then you stood in danger of getting it. So we couldn't just talk to somebody. Um, they didn't want to spend the time dragging people out of the city. So if somebody was in danger of getting the plague or if somebody was suspected of having the plague, then you just leave them where they are, kept them at home. And the cities would sometimes be locked down um, and everybody would stay indoors. Um, people would actually come around and lock houses from the outside and there was a quarantine in the city. Stay where you are. We assume that the plague is in the city already and we'll deal with it by keeping people in their place. There was complete control over bodies, there was complete control over households and there was this constant inspection. Guards would go along the streets and register, find out are people alive or dead? Are they sick or are they healthy? Are they contagious? Why are they no longer contagious? A constant registering of knowledge. And that is how people dealt with the plague. So essentially we've got two completely different technologies or deal, ways of dealing 
with epidemics. The leprosy technique involves exclusion. The plague technique involves inclusion within the city walls. The leprosy technique closes people out. The plague technique closes people in. The leprosy technique assumes that the community is pure and we mustn't let it get infected. The plague technique assumes that it's already infected and needs purifying. The leprosy puts walls, leprosy technique puts walls around the community. The plague technique uses the walls within the community. Leprosy technique uses the sentries on, on the gates. The plague technique puts sentries on streets. Leprosy technique has a quarantine outside the walls. The plague technique puts a quarantine inside the walls. The leprosy technique has a binary category of healthy, unhealthy. Can you get in or can you not? The plague technique has lots of categories, alive or dead, contagious or uncontagious, recovering and so on. The leprosy technique restricts bodies. Can it come in or not? The plague technique controls bodies. Once they're in, they need to be controlled and observed. The leprosy technique makes use of registers, knowledge about bodies, but they only need to be used once in order to decide whether they can come in or not. The plague technique uses registers as well, but it's used constantly and they need to be constantly updated. Find out whether somebody's still alive, but also whether they're recovering, whether they're sick, um, what is their status at any one time. So they use completely different techniques in many ways, but at the same time, they also both use data. They use data about people, about their bodies, um, and they use ways of controlling movement. And they encode people. They give people statuses, which then have legal power. And I think some of these techniques are things that are familiar to us. So uh, one of the things we'll talk about in the lesson is the things that happened during Corona, how would we categorize them? Did um, our countries use leprosy techniques or plague techniques during Corona? And what can be categorized as what? And the relevance of all this is that we're talking about the move from exclusion to inclusion, but notice that it's a move that was made on account of effectivity, not on account of morality. In actual fact, leprosy returned and was not fully really handled until the Norwegian Dr. Hansen, a man from Bergen, um, identified the bacteria, the um, bacillum, um, that caused leprosy in 1873. And that allowed him, that laboratory work, allowed him to develop a way of identifying whether anybody is um, uh, suffering from leprosy in a very scientific way. But he himself accepted that what really made a difference and what made, made Norway um, really good at stamping out leprosy um, in the 1800s was not his laboratory work, but the administrative and legal work of telling people, I'm sorry, you can't hang around with other people now. We're going to have to put you in a leprosy hospital. We'll look after you, but you can't live with families anymore. And that move, taking people out and separating them from the rest of the bodies, that was what really made the numbers of lepers come right down in the 1800s. Today, the World Health Organization note that Leprosy is curable. Since the 1940s, we've had a cure. And yet there are still 200,000 people suffering from leprosy in the world, over half of which um, are in India. It's a curable disease. It's the medieval epidemic that everybody paid attention to, to in the Middle Ages because they remember it from Christianity, from the Christian Bible and the Hebrew Bible. Today, it doesn't have that kind of echo. And although it's curable, we're not curing it. And it's curious that we discovered in the Middle Ages how to deal with leprosy, and yet it's still an unsolvable problem.